Hey, Crossings community. Thanks for uh, joining us in this uh, little, not, we're not sure what to call this uh, time together, but it is a way for us to gather. It is a way for us to be a community uh, even when we're apart. Um, as I mentioned in the letter that we sent out, hopefully most people have read at one point or another, this is unprecedented times in our culture. We just don't know how to move forward necessarily, and, and all of us feel like we're guessing a little bit. But because of the virus, because of what's going on throughout the world, uh, we felt it was important to kind of take a pause, uh, cancel our gatherings for the 15th and 22nd, and um, just meet in this way, at least for a couple weeks. As we said in the letter, we, we don't claim to know the severity of what is going on. We don't know uh, or claim to know the impact of the virus. It could be incredibly dangerous and lasting, it, and it could all be blown out of proportion. We don't, we don't know. But we do know that as a community at Crossings, we've kind of been given the task of, of caring for each other well and, and, and being aware of what's going on. And for those that, that may be more susceptible to the virus, we, we just want to be aware of all of that. So the decision that we made to do what we're doing is not out of, honestly, it's not out of fear. It's not out of panic. It's, it's simply based upon this desire to uh, be compassionate and attempt to be good caretakers of what God has given us to be caretakers of. Um, we're trying to be smart. Uh, we know there's a lot going on in our culture at this time, but, but these decisions for us are based upon trying to follow Jesus as close as we can and to be something in this world, maybe a non-anxious presence in a very anxious culture and world. We don't know, but, but we're gonna try and um, that's why we've gathered in this way. Over the next little bit, you're going to uh, hear a teaching uh, from Molly. It was the teaching that was scheduled for this Sunday, and it actually centers around uh, the Eucharist or the common meal. So I would encourage you to maybe stop for a second and get some bread and juice if you, already, if you don't already have something with you there, because it will come into play later. You're gonna hear Molly teach, you're gonna hear some prayers, you're gonna hear some of the things that we normally do on a Sunday. And, and like I said, this is a way for us to gather. It is a way for us to be together, even though we're at a distance. So again, thank you for doing this. Uh, thank you for joining us in this way. Thank you for understanding the decisions we're trying to make and trying to um, be sensitive to Jesus leading us. Uh, we are a community that is trying to find their way back to God. And we will always be that, whether we're meeting together or meeting like this. So for taking this time, for uh, understanding why we're doing what we're doing, we're very grateful. Uh, please let us know if we can help in any way. Let us know what's going on with you if you, if you need our assistance. Uh, you can continue to check for updates at our website, but probably the best place to get the most recent updates is on our Facebook page. And if you have trouble finding any of that, simply email info at crossingsknoxville.com and we'd be glad to get any of that to you. So again, thanks for uh, joining us here today for this. Good morning, or afternoon, or evening, whenever you decide to listen to this. We are spending the season of um, Lent, many people uh, call it Lent, walking slowly through the last days of Jesus' life. If you look at the four Gospels, you'll start to realize that much of those books are made up of the last few days of the life of Jesus. They each give an interesting amount of space to these last days. And we're calling this slow Lent. As we slowly move through the last days of Jesus' life, we're also encouraging uh, each other to slow down the pace of our life. And if you're finding it difficult to cancel plans uh, to slow down the pace of life, the world has arranged a few things to help you out with that. Um, so thank you for being part of um, whatever we call this uh, today. If you would like to follow along with the text, the scripture, uh, the songs, some of the quotes, some of the prayers, there is a PDF that goes along with these videos uh, that you can look at as you watch. Today's story uh, that we're gonna study might be one of the most famous stories in the last days of Jesus' life. Uh, all kinds of artists have depicted it it's a story we refer back to basically every week as we gather. Uh, and today I'm going to use uh, kind of a slow storytelling technique uh, from the godly play curriculum that sometimes our kids will use uh, 
on Sundays. It goes something like this. When you want to remember something really important, how do you do it? You might say it to yourself over and over. I, I have to remember, I have to remember. You might ask your mom or your dad to help you remember. You might write it down. People have very interesting ways of remembering really important things. Today, our story is about remembering and a time Jesus wanted his disciples to remember something really important. I wonder if you see anything that might help us tell our story today. On the last day Jesus spent on earth with his disciples before he was killed, it was the first day of the Passover feast. Passover was a time when all of Israel remembered the time when God rescued them when they were slaves in Egypt. At the Passover, God had every household take a lamb and sacrifice it and spread the blood over their doorposts. They went inside and were saved. Outside, the angel of death passed through the land. And when it saw the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of the Israelites, it passed over them and that house was saved. The next morning, God led his people out of Egypt, out of slavery. So the Passover feast was a very important feast every year. And Jesus wanted to eat the Passover with his friends. So Jesus called Peter and John to go ahead and make preparations. Peter and John said, but master, where shall we eat the Passover? Jesus said, go into the city. You will find a man carrying water. He will greet you. You will follow him into a house. Tell the owner of the house that the teacher has asked where he can eat the Passover meal with his disciples. The owner will show you a large room upstairs that will be ready for us. This is where you can make the preparations. And Peter and John found everything just as it was supposed to be, just as Jesus had described it. When everything was ready, Jesus and the other disciples joined them at the table. When everything was ready, Jesus and the other disciples reclined at the table and remembered the story of Passover. But this Passover was not like other Passovers. Jesus had something very important to tell his friends, something very important for them to remember. During the feast, Jesus took the special Passover bread he broke it and he said, this is my body that is broken for you. Do this to remember me. Later in the meal, Jesus took the special Passover wine and he said, this is the cup 
It is a new promise in my blood which is poured out for you. Drink it to remember me. Jesus told them many other important things to remember. He told them that he wouldn't be with them much longer. He told them that he was going to leave them, but they were not going to be alone, that they would have each other and they would have the Holy Spirit. He also told them that somebody at the table, eating with them and drinking with them, was going to betray him. So Jesus and the disciples started to wonder who that would be, who would do something like that. It made them sad and angry. They started fighting each other right in the middle of the dinner table. They started fighting about which one of them was best and, and who would betray Jesus. But Jesus told them to stop. He told them that life following him looks very different than it looks to everyone else. Ever since that day, since Jesus has first shared the cup and the bread, people all over the world have been remembering Jesus with bread and with wine. Sometimes they do this in big cathedrals with beautiful windows. Sometimes they do this in churches like ours, buildings downtown in the middle of all the restaurants. Sometimes they do this made of little tiny houses, made of sticks and mud. Sometimes they do this in homes with family and friends. Some places pass the bread and the juice separately. In some places, people hold out their hands and they're given the bread and they're given the juice. In some places, you take the bread and you dip it in the juice. In some places, they're individually wrapped, packaged juice and bread pieces due to coronavirus. People call this all kinds of things, communion, the Lord's Supper, the Holy Eucharist. We call it common meal because we have a lot of differences, all of us in community together. We look different. We think different, we believe different things, we've done different things. But when we take this bread and this juice, we all have this meal in common. This meal reminds us that we need each other and that we need God, just like we need food. So I wonder what you remember best about this story. I wonder what else the disciples might have remembered about Jesus. I wonder what you think of when you take this bread and drink this juice. I wonder what part of this story you like best. I wonder if there are parts of this story that are hard for you. So I was kind of thrown off uh, today because this teaching that we had already had planned for this morning is about one of the most practical, one of the most um, tangible things that we do uh, as we gather on Sundays. And um, we can't do that together today. Um, so I do encourage you uh, before you continue to find some juice or some wine if you're feeling crazy uh, or some bread or some crackers because uh, in a little bit we are going to give you some time whether you're home alone whether you're with friends family um, to participate in kind of uh, what this whole thing is all about what this whole study is all about this morning and there were two important things that Jesus was trying to tell his friends the night of the last supper uh, he was trying to tell them goodbye their leader their rabbi their teacher their friend um, they didn't always get it right, but they were starting to put pieces together about who this person was and that he was just going to go away. Like they would look like such fools. What were they supposed to do? What was he doing saying 
goodbye. There's a story told by Frederick Buechner. You have it in that PDF if you're looking at it. Buechner says this, a woman with a scarf over her head hoists her six-year-old up into the first step of the school bus. Goodbye, she says. A father on the phone with his freshman son has just finished bawling him out for his poor grades. There's mostly silence at the other end of the line. Well, goodbye, the father says. When the girl at the airport hears the announcement that her plane is starting to board, she turns to the boy who is seeing her off. I guess this is goodbye, she says. The noise of the traffic almost drowns out the sound of the word, but the shape of it lingers on the old man's lips. He tries to look vigorous and resourceful as he holds out his hand to the other old man. Goodbye. This time they say it so nearly in unison that it makes them both smile. It was a long while ago that the words, God be with you, disappeared into the word goodbye. But every now and again, some trace of it still glimmers through. In, in the same act of breaking this bread and drinking this wine, Jesus was telling his friends goodbye, but he was also telling them God would be with them forever. Goodbye. God be with you. In this meal, Jesus says goodbye and to remember this bread and this wine, two very common elements in life. These would be used for thousands of years to remember the story of God, to remember the Passover and rescue from Egypt, to remember the death and resurrection of Christ, to the sending of the Holy Spirit, to remember the courage of the early church. And, and not just remembering like nostalgic, like, oh, remember that nice time? It's not a passive remembrance, it's active. This is a participatory remembrance. And there are so many angles you can come at this teaching, so many books, so many elements and exegetical pieces that make up this story of the Last Supper. But at the end of the day, those things don't matter a whole lot. That's, that's what makes this a common meal. At the end of the day, this is some common bread and some common wine and some common people. And no matter how much we know in our heads, Jesus was telling his disciples that night and tells us today that God is doing this thing for the world and we have been made part of it. And it's interesting uh, because within the whole discussion about how this bread and this wine draw us into community and into a story, the disciples begin arguing about who is the best. It's interesting because over the years, nothing has separated the church and the community of God over the ages. And nothing has caused more disagreements and arguments than this meal. Like the number of denominations and church splits over this and who can take it and how it should be done. But we're at this table with Jesus, who's trying to tell us goodbye and a way forward. And we still try and find ways to like totally mess this thing up. We're still the ones who betray Jesus, who are embarrassed. We're still the ones who argue about who is better and who is more right about Jesus. We're just as confused and as worried as the disciples were that day. And, and, and yet Jesus knew these guys, knew who they were, knew what would happen, knew how much they would totally mess things up. But he broke the bread and he poured the wine for them. So now uh, we invite you to go listen to the Ian Morgan Cron video. There's a link uh, that should be along with the link to this video, but also on that PDF you have. Um, so watch that video of somebody else's story about the bread and the wine. Uh, and then we're giving you two songs that you might want to play, listen to, sing along or not. Um, and then there's a prayer on that sheet that we gave you uh, to pray before or after you take your bread and your wine. Now uh, we say this prayer together in all of our different places, uh, knowing that in some crazy mysterious way, uh, despite everything going on and the ways that we are trying to distance ourselves from each other, uh, there is something powerful and mysterious in our 
praying and taking this meal uh, in all of our places. So God in our waking, God in our sleeping, God in our working, God in our waiting, may this bread and this cup remind us of the active and unifying presence of your Holy Spirit, both in this moment and forever. Amen. So each week through Lent, we've been trying to do some things and suggesting some ways to practice this slow faith, uh, ways to allow our faith in God to impact our own postures and our own priorities outside of a Sunday gathering. Uh, we talk about all the time about how being a faith community is so much more than just our Sunday gatherings. Um, and I think this pandemic situation kind of puts that to a test. It's kind of, this situation is kind of a dare to our faith? Like, can we be a faith community that continues to stay in contact with one another, that continues to take care of one another, that continues to take care of our neighbors, that is this non-anxious presence in the world outside of our gathering on Sundays? So this week, our practice is about slow food, slow meals, slow tables, slow eating, and there's uh, plenty of ways to practice this that are listed in the uh, PDF that, that you have, and you may have more ideas. We'd love to hear them. But basically, uh, eating, the practice of gathering around a table has often become such a mindless act for many of us. Many of us are privileged enough to have options uh, and abundance of food choices and so much to do before and after we eat that we, we often just rush through the meals, which is both like physically unhealthy um, but also contributes to the speed of things. I mean, fast food is like a food group. Anyway, the suggestion is to choose three meals this week and to do them slowly, uh, from the buying of the food to the preparation of the food until after the meal is done. You can check out that PDF. Um, but we leave you and encourage you, and we'd love to hear from you. Um, we'd love any interaction that you have on the Facebook page, um, to let us know how you're kind of doing this week, how you're um, doing with this meal in your home, with your family, what that experience was like for you, but also what this slow meal thing uh, was for you um, and how even just the, the meals that we eat could totally change uh, the people we become. Again, we are grateful that you would join us in this way to kind of gather and to study together and, and and just take a moment to pause in the midst of the chaos that is this world. And so we appreciate you um, joining us here, appreciate you understanding the wrestling that we're going through to try to lead our community well, both the staff and the leaders of Crossing. So, so thank you for that. Um, before we go, just reminders like we normally do, there are some things coming up. There are a couple Kid City events, including a trip to a farm, uh, a Stucco event, uh, there's Seder suppers coming up. Um, those are right now staying on the calendar. Uh, as, as we progress, as we uh, discern what to do next, uh, we'll keep you posted on those. But we wanted to, to keep those on your radar. Uh, the, the Harmony Center thing is the 25th of March. Uh, the Kid City trip to uh, uh, the Cox's Farm is the 28th. Uh, the Stucco event is the 27th. And the Seder Suppers are April 9th. Again, just stay posted on those, but keep those on your calendar. And then one more thing, um, as always, we invite you to worship through giving. Um, that's obviously a little different in this way. And, and honestly, we're a little concerned because of the separation and, and financially what that will do to us. So, so please know that. But please know that we look at giving as worship. And if you'd still like to do that, even though we're not gathering together, you can do that online. Uh, CrossingsKnoxville.com is where you would go to do that. And there's a tab that says online GBTG, which is giving back to God. You just click on that and, and it'll take you through it. And if you have any questions or trouble with it, please let us know. We'd be glad to help in any way. And now, uh, as we do in each gathering, we, we say the word shalom. 
the Hebrew word, which means the, the way it was intended to be, that we're going to pursue this. And, and in a sense, more than ever, in this anxious world, we need to pursue this kind of peace, this, um, this type of wholeness. And so let me um, close with a prayer that uh, our friend Jim Schmotzer from Bellingham, Washington, just sent to me. I got it just a few seconds ago. And as I read this, and then we can wish each other this wholeness that, that we do each week. It's a prayer uh, by Cameron Wiggins Bellum. It says, May we who are merely inconvenienced remember those whose lives are at stake. May we who have no risk factors remember those most vulnerable. May we who have the luxury of working from home remember those who must choose between preserving their health or making their rent. May we who have the flexibility to care for our children when their school closes remember that they have no, that remember those that have no options. May we who have to cancel our trips remember those who have no safe place to go. And may we who are losing our margin money in the tumult of the economic market remember those who have no margin at all. May we who settle in for a quarantine at home remember those who have no home. As fear grips our country, let us choose love during this time when we cannot physically wrap our arms around each other. Let us find ways to be the loving embrace of God to our neighbor. Amen. Shalom.